Hello, um, my name is Knut Vogt. I'm from the Friedrich Naumann Foundation and I'm the head of the Office of the North of Germany. On behalf of the Foundation, I would like to welcome to our webinar Empowering Butchern Civil Society Overcoming Challenges and Finding Solutions. CSOs in Bhutan are local nonprofit organizations that play a significant role in the development of the country by aim the complement and supplement of efforts of the government. The CSOs in the country are involved in social welfare and community development activities by addressing social issues such as poverty elevation, education, health and gender inclusivity. Among the many areas it serves, strangery, democracy and contribution to development are the most crucial. Beside these contributions from CSOs, there are inherent challenges with regard to limited capacity and operational setups, sustainability due to high dependency on external foundation, lack of clarity and direction, weak research and advocate capacity. It's a limited cooperation among CSOs that affect CSOs functions. Some of the challenges are tied to inability to attract highly qualified profit and retention of these staff leading to a series of limitations, including their international and research capacities. Sourcing, founding continue to be existing issues for the CSOs in the country and in addition, in addition the expansion on their work to, uh, to the other countries there, uh, where their visibility is low, which leads to limited understanding on, of their roles among the, these communities. Today, the aim of the webinar on the role of the CSO, uh, CSOs in the modern Bhutan, the way forward to shed light on these challenges and panel discussions, uh, discussions on the role of their CSOs, challenges of the sector will discuss the opportunities to forge the way, uh, the way forward. But before we invite our keynote speaker, we would like to play a video which gives a glimpse and a role of society organizing, organizing Bhutan. Uh, this video produced by Chu Ling. Chu Ling is a self-taught cinema uh, photographer, editor, and photographer. He's edited a short film like Red Door, worked on line producer for the critical acclaim and future film, The Red Follows. So we have a short film that will be two minutes. Yes, thank you. And now I can present you our keynote speaker, Reinhard Wolf. Reinhard Wolf is the president of the German Bhutan Himalaya Society. Mr. Wolf has a master degree in forestry and has been working in the development of cooperation with the German International Cooperation since 1983. From 1983 to 1989, uh, 90, 93, I think. He spent 10 years in uh, Africa and then from 1997 to 2002, five years in Bhutan. 
From 2002 until the retirement in 2020, he has been working at the GIC, GSZ, I think, a headquarter in Germany, where he has oversaw projects in field of environment and resource protection in Asia. His second focus was the forest and the climate change and international climate policy. Very welcome to you, Mr. Wolf. It's your space. Thank you very much, Mr. Voigt, and uh, thank you to the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for the invitation and the opportunity to participate in this webinar. It's always an honor and privilege to, to join. And uh, congratulations for again choosing a highly relevant topic. So just a few words about our society, the German Bhutan Himalaya Society. It's one of the eldest uh, Bhutan Friendship Society in, in Europe. And we will celebrate next year the 40th anniversary. So among others, uh, we conduct annually a conference uh, in Germany covering relevant topics. So this year on 24th of June, uh, our conference theme uh, is is the economy of Bhutan and uh, gross national happiness, GNH. And uh, so if you like to know more, uh, probably you can just check on our web page or Facebook and, and uh, we also on LinkedIn and other social media accounts. But most important, um, our society has supported and will continue to support uh, activities of various Bhutanese civil society organizations. And uh, we do this often in cooperation with other Bhutan friendship uh, societies, especially from Switzerland and Austria, where we sometimes join in supporting various activities. Now, a few words about uh, civil society organization in Bhutan, and we have seen this um, introduction. Um, and so I, I don't need to uh, reiterate this, uh, but it's clear that CSOs are playing a very important role uh, in, in, in Bhutan, uh, in the society. And uh, you know that much better than me, um, that recently a strategy document uh, with the title on the collaboration between the parliament of Bhutan and with civil society organization has been released where the significance of CSO has been recognized, the significance in the transformation process of the country. And recently in a newspaper article uh, published in Bhutan Times, it was mentioned that more than 350,000 citizens accounting to almost half of the total national population directly benefited from the public services of uh, uh, CSOs provided. So this is very impressive. And uh, that CSOs covered more than 50,000 households accounting to more than 30% of the total households in, in Bhutan's 20 districts. So very impressive figures and congratulations, congratulations to, to the CSOs for, for these really uh, valuable services. Um, in the video, it was always also mentioned um, the challenges. And again, I don't want to uh, repeat this, uh, but at the end, uh, maybe for the panelists, I, I have a few questions for discussion. So um, we are we know that there are different roles of government and of CSOs. Uh, so the question is, are those roles clear and to what extent and in what areas should CSOs take over tasks from the state, from the government? So this probably some of the panelists could elaborate on this. And then we have heard uh, that uh, finance to receive uh, adequate finance is a challenge for the CSOs. And the question, one question is, uh, how can it be achieved that CSOs also receive financial support from the Bhutanese civil society? 
and uh, whether this has been already achieved. I know that, uh, and, and that's also the topic of our next annual conference, that the ex economy in Bhutan is in a, different, a difficult situation, uh, but nevertheless, uh, the question is whether the, the civil society in Bhutan is also providing uh, support. And um, well, again, Congratulations to the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for this uh, very important topic. And uh, so I'm looking forward for a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much and Tashi Delek. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. Um, now I have the pleasure to, uh, to present you our moderator of the day. She is um, an independent journalist from more than a decade of experience in all uh, forms of media, Namgi, I think I was, was, was right. Yes, okay. Is a trainer and consultant for media and gender issues. She is a mental health educate. And Namgi is a young Asian leader and Fulbright Humphrey fellow, I think. I think. She re resigned as the executive director of Journalist Association of Bhutan in March of 2023. Uh, three. So propose the social justice projects. So thank you, Amgi, that you are today uh, making uh, our panelists and as our, our moderator. So if your space, thank you for everything. Thank you uh, for the introduction, Knut. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you to our panel today. It is Empowering Putini Civil Society, Overcoming Challenges and Finding Solutions. I would like to introduce our panelists now. First, but it's not in a lot of preference, but in a random order, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Rinzi Rinzi. He is the chair of the Bhutan Civil Society Network that uh, Reinhardt just talked about in one of the questions that he wanted asked in the panel discussion. He is also the executive director of the Bhutan Transparency Initiative. Uh, it is a CSO that promotes transparency, accountability, and integrity. A lot of work that has been done here and a lot um, that Dr. Rinzi Rinzi will be sharing in this panel as well. He also happens to be a former member of parliament. Our second panelist is Dr. Zenchal Hamo. She is the executive director of the Bhutan Center for Media and Democracy. This is one of the first ever CSOs in Bhutan. So the Bhutan Center for Media and Democracy, BCMD, encourages media lit literacy, uh, participation in democracy, basically works at the intersection of media dem and democracy. Uh, Otenji, if I could uh, request you to turn on your camera. Lam. Also, we have, yes, that's Dr. Zechel Hummel for you. And we have our final panelist, also a good friend of mine, uh, Sangeet Siring. He is the president of uh, Loden Foundation, one of our biggest CSOs here. They support and promote education as well as social entrepreneurship. Also, congratulations on 24 years of Loden Foundation. I think you just had your founding day about two years ago. So Tashi Dele uh, from my side. Sangeet also happens to be an accomplished entrepreneur. So how we're going to be doing this panel discussion today is we'll have a round of introductions and a bit of background and context uh, from our panelists. Uh, then we're going to be moving into Q&A. Uh, we'll be taking questions from you as we're having this conversation among ourselves. So we're not going to keep it towards the end of the program. But as we're speaking, please feel free to send in your questions via Facebook and via YouTube. And there'll be somebody who'll be sending the questions across to me as well. So with that, I would like to uh, request Dr. Rinzi Rinzi to talk about your work and talk about civil society in Padana. Okay, Dr. Rinzi, uh, can you hear me? La? Oops, I think we lost. Okay, he's back. All right, I'm back. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Some technical glitches. Uh, love and greetings to everybody all over the world who are uh, watching this event. La. Uh, honor and a privilege to uh, be, a, be a participant here. Uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Nam Namgela. Uh, just look at my notes a bit. Here we go. Okay. Uh, just some uh, uh, data, uh, background information, although Mr. Wolf was kind enough to 
throw some light on the CSO center and registered. One uh, wanted to be a CBO uh, instead of a C registered CS CSO. So uh, 40, people, 40 public benefit organizations and 12 uh, mutual benefit organizations. Uh, together, uh, the 52 CSOs, we call ourselves as Bhutan Civil Society Network. Uh, we are we are uh, governed by by an executive com committee composed of ten uh, uh, members. Uh, eight are uh, elected from eight uh, thematic groups, while two are the eminent uh, members who are also members of the board, CSOA board. Uh, I'll, I'll briefly uh, touch uh, recap on the roles of CSOs in Bhutan. Now uh, we the CSOs. Uh, we believe ourselves to be a group of compassionate and passionate citizens committed to supplement and complement the novel efforts of the government to ensure that no one is left behind, that the unreached are reached and the unheard are heard. This is why our works range from contributing to socioeconomic development to promoting and preserving tradition and culture, to promoting environmental conservation, to enhancing uh, good governance. Uh, and our contributions, Again, Mr. Wolf was kind enough to uh, make a brief, brief presentation on this. Our contribution to nation building, although modest have been laudable, given that we are only uh, 52 uh, registered CSOs today. For instance, in the last three years, 2020 to 2022, we provided employment for 2,068 Bhutanese. Now for a small, small society like ours, it's a, this is a huge number. Uh, we had 29,312 volunteers serving uh, our citizens all over the country. Uh, uh, 354,950 citizens, uh, which is just about, like Mr. Wolf said, 50% of the total population, directly benefited from the services that we provided. Uh, we also generated a total revenue of Milton 1.825 billion, which is also huge for a small economy like ours. Nevertheless, uh, we have our own challenges to tackle. So I'll just uh, highlight uh, three major challenges that the CSOs are facing right now. Uh, first, obviously, <laughs> is the financial sustainability. Uh, without any direct financial support from the state or the government, and with negligible contributions from domestic uh, non-governmental organizations and philanthropists, CSOs have to depend entirely on funding support from uh, development partners and philanthropists from abroad. And most of the supports are short-term, and project-based. Now this itself uh, uh, presents another uh, problem. Thus only a few CSOs have been faring well thus far. Uh, this is a problem that most CSOs have to live with on almost daily basis. Uh, second problem that we face is CSO to CSO networking at the regional and international level, which is very, uh, who are at the, at the moment almost non-existent uh, with most of the uh, CSOs. We have neither or no or limited uh, link linkages with CSOs abroad to interact with and share knowledge and ex experiences. I'll dwell on this further later. Uh, thirdly, uh, there are you know not very desirable perceptions about CSOs in the country. Uh, this is basically because the C concept of registered CSOs as we know today is fairly new to Bhutan. Besides, uh, we CSOs ourselves have not been able to create adequate public awareness uh, about our roles as well as our contributions to nation building. Now we are working uh, regularly on this. Therefore, there is a dearth of knowledge and the general public alike, uh, which has led to major misconceptions and misunderstandings about CSOs uh, in the recent past especially during uh, 2020 and 2021, whereby uh, we were in media more than once or twice, uh, where we were, you know, uh, uh, dubbed as self-serving, running family businesses, being corrupt, and so on. Nevertheless, we have opportunities to look at uh, also. Uh, we'll do, I'll deal on this uh, for a while maybe present about five opportunities, major ones. Uh, again, Mr. Wolf already touched on this topic. The first one is, uh, there are two important documents which, which will contribute a lot to enhancing collaboration between the CSOs and the government and CSOs and the parliament. The first one is the draft 
uh, government CSO collaboration guidelines. Of course, it has been in a draft form for the last two years, but we hope that this will be approved by the uh, government very soon. And uh, as mentioned by Mr. Wolf again, uh, there's the Parliament CSO collaboration uh, strategy, which was launched, uh, formally launched last uh, month. As these documents are put into action, collaborations between the CSOs and the executive, that's the government and CSOs and the legislature can be expected to improve drastically. And uh, in turn, collaborations with other institutions, organizations and citizenry, citizenry can also be expected to follow suit. Uh, the other opportunity that we see is uh, the improving collaboration, cooperation and coordination among ourselves, among the CSOs, uh, especially during the uh, recent years. Uh, th this will ensure that CSOs are focused on, the, on their mandates, that there's no duplication of works, that CSOs remain relevant, and that CSOs are able to share resources and del uh, deliver better public services. Uh, third opportunity we see is the opportunity to develop networking with regional and international uh, CSOs. We have approached various development partners. Uh, I would like to sound this to uh, FNF as well. Uh, to help us with this. Uh, this can be expected to enhance the capacity of CSOs in improving collaborations with various stakeholders, mobilizing funds and so on, which is what we uh, are not very good at. The fourth opportunity that we see is uh, building an endowment fund, which most <laughs> development partners do not seem to uh, like to uh, listen to, but this is the need of the hour for CSOs. Uh, to ensure that CSOs are able to remain vibrant and dynamic and continue to contribute to nation building, there is an urgent need to create an endowment fund for CSOs. We are consistently, consistently pursuing, with, pursuing this issue uh, with uh, development uh, uh, pa partners, and we, uh, we hope that the development partners will see reason in this. Uh, lab, last but not the least, the opportunity that we see is ongoing efforts to enhance accountability, transparency, and integrity of CSOs. Uh, an assessment of the internal governance mechanism of CSOs in Bhutan uh, in 2021 was conducted by Bhutan uh, Transparency in Initiative, uh, which I look after. Uh, the study showed that CSOs in Bhutan have good internal governance mechanism, which is a good thing. Uh, and this study was uh, conducted basically uh, because of the backlashes that we, that we received in 20, yeah, 2020 and 2021. Further, in a collaborative, uh, um, a consultative workshop among, among the Anti Corruption Commission of Bhutan, the Bhutan Civil Society Network, and the CSO Authority, uh, again organized by Bhutan Transparency Initiative, the three institutions mutually agreed to develop a standard with the aim to further enhance good governance in all CSOs in the country. This gave but to the Bhutan CSO Accountability Standards 2023, because 2023. Uh, the standard is ready to be implemented. In fact, uh, uh, before 15th of this month, we are uh, the, the three institutions, uh, we are uh, you know, giving a tra training to all the, all the 52 C CSOs on how to really implement, it, implement this uh, standard. This is expected to enhance the image of CSOs and therefore the trust and confidence uh, of the public in CSOs. I must emphasize uh, that- uh, Dr. Renzi, yeah. I'll come no. back. I think ask you some more details. I'll just head around uh, oh, to Dr. Venture as well, and then come back and request you to speak in detail about this, especially the opportunities. Thank, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Les, uh, Dr. Renzi, now I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Sancho, um to talk to us about the work that VCMD does and also about a space civic engagement because you've had so much experience in this, Les. Um, Lassa, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I hope I'm audible. So um, as uh, Namge mentioned, I was asked to talk about uh, Bhutan Center for Media and Democracy and uh, touch a little bit on uh, civic engagement in Bhutan. And I've taken the liberty of adding a third section to that where I would uh, you know, speak to uh, two or three uh, points about CSOs in the country. Um, Bhutan Center for Media and Democracy was established in 2008 when uh, the country uh, transitioned from uh, monarchy to a uh, democratic constitutional monarchy. 
And uh, the, our objective was to nurture and improve the standard of, of media in the country, which is critical to fostering uh, democracy, a culture of democracy. And um, we work in the area of governance, media, democracy, and we work with a cross section of society from young people to marginalized groups, educators and policymakers to uh, elected leaders. And our activities range from our experiential training programs to forums, on topics of um, national importance and uh, creation of Bhutan-centric resources, both in print and multimedia formats. So in our 15 years of existence, we have supported the country um, at the national goal of strengthening democracy by inspiring active uh, citizenship, inclusivity in public deliberation and policy processes, expanding uh, media literacy, promoting civic space and contributing to knowledge uh, creation. Uh, we have also developed a model of youth engagement that resulted in the revision of the country's uh, national youth policy back in 2020. And uh, we are also helping the uh, local governments uh, operationalize our very own development philosophy of gross mm -hmm. national happiness, making public consultation participatory and inclusive. Uh, we are also contributing to expanding media literacy, media and democracy literacy across the country. And uh, we are uh, one of the first organizations to incorporate sign language in our forums uh, and resources, making education and information accessible to all. So a little bit on our civic engagement in Bhutan. Uh, traditionally, we are a collective society and uh, community vitality is uh, in our DNA. Uh, in the past, uh, during my parents' time, uh, you know, community residents took turns to help each other out during uh, seasons of plantation and harvest, and also contribute to constructing houses for their neighbors. Local festivals brought people together, uh, you know, to celebrate. But uh, with modernization, individualism is on the rise, and sense of community is on the decline. And as uh, more citizens became educated, they moved from rural to urban places in search of jobs, weakening their ties with place of birth. But on the other hand, the sense of belonging to their place of residence remains much to be nurtured for several reasons. Uh, and based on my experience of uh, you know, uh, working with local uh, gov government elected leaders and communities, one of the reasons is that uh, though local government is a uh, an apolitical entity, but because the leaders are democratically elected, uh, public consultations on community development needs are exclusive only to registered voters. Um, many other residents have limited voice nor share a sense of ownership of the community of residents. And second reason, and very closely related to the first, is an, um, an interesting misinterpretation of the eligible age uh, of uh, eligible age to vote, they extend it to a consultation as well at the community level, and that excludes young people from uh, community engagement. And uh, similarly, uh, culturally, there is a strong belief that people with disabilities are unaware of community affairs, and uh, the days of the senior citizens are gone, so they should pursue you know, a spiritual path. So these kind of cultural beliefs uh, limit the civic participation of uh, these groups in Bhutan. And uh, moving on to uh, you know, talk about a little bit about uh, CSOs in the country and which uh, Dr. Rinzen Rinzen already uh, gave a very good uh, overview. Um, the concept of uh, civil society as citizens coming together to respond to common pro problems is uh, traditionally ingrained in our collective society. But civil society organizations as the organized entity with physical existence is a new phenomenon. And the general public uh, have limited understanding of uh, civil society organizations. Uh, we are either mistaken for the government or the private sector. So we have a lot to do in terms of bringing visibility to the civil society sector and forging a, an identity of our own. So that is one of the challenges uh, that I have seen working in the civil society sector. A uh, second one is, uh, since the uh, formal enactment of the Civil Society Act in 2007, uh, there ha we have only 54 registered CSOs in the country. Uh, and on an average, I think less than eight organizations were registered every year. 
while a rigorous vetting process can ensure registration of credible CSOs in the country, but a stringent process can also stem the growth of the civil society sector. And this can have further ramification on the size of the civil society sector. Our sector smallness can be a disadvantage and a disincentive for individuals who have interest in nonprofit work, thereby limiting the sector's attractiveness as another job market. And consequently, this limits our, our contribution to the country's social political development. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ozenjo, for sharing that and oh, for pro providing another context um, to how uh, the CSO sector functions in Bhutan. I'd um, like to invite Sange from Loden Foundation now um, to share your experience, um, the kind of work that Loden Foundation does with everybody who's watching us. Thank you, Namge. Uh, hi, I'm Sange. Uh, I was a beneficiary of uh, Loden Foundation of 2010. Uh, I was supported uh, for a venture I started called Mops and Condoms, which is a cleaning service agency. And I revealed the funding from the foundation. Uh, five, six years down the line, I became a trustee. And uh, since uh, 2010, I've been involved with Loden Foundation. And uh, January, 2022, uh, I, I became the president of Loden Foundation. Uh, the foundation is very close to my heart. Uh, so, uh, where, where do we come in? What's Loden Foundation? So our focus area is three. Uh, we have the entrepreneurship program under which we uh, give the seed money, where, which, is, which is the biggest at this moment. Uh, even somebody who's actually availed the service myself, I can share that uh, a lot has happened, a lot has transitioned, a lot has changed, uh, but uh, uh, access to finance is, is still a big bottleneck for a lot of people who want to start business uh, but not having anything to a mortgage, uh, not a piece of land or not a house. So access to finance is still a difficulty. Uh, this is where loading comes in. We bridge that gap. Uh, there are a few institutions now uh, which give microfinancing loans uh, at a very minimal uh, lending rate. And uh, this has happened over the years. Uh, through the education program itself, we also do the student uh, uh, entrepreneurship empowerment program. We reach out to educational institutions because we believe that uh, entrepreneurship is it's more of an entrepreneurial mindset, uh, uh, an idea. So uh, we need to uh, reach out to young people and then instill this entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, we also uh, train a lot of young people and uh, we reach out and uh, uh, then uh, build up this whole uh, chain of a young people understanding what entrepreneurship is and actually pursuing a career or actually making uh, entrepreneurship a, a lifestyle. Uh, when it comes to the second program, uh, we do education initiatives where we actually uh, give uh, scholarships uh, and uh, to young scholars and to even uh, individuals who are deserving uh, to pursue the tertiary education. And then we have the third program, uh, which is the, the cultural initiative, where a lot of documentation, cultural documentation is happening. Uh, there is a lot of initiative on the tangible aspect of uh, cultural preservation in Bhutan, but a, a lot of content on the intangible cultural heritage uh, is uh, it was not necessarily done, and this is where loading comes in. We have uh, numerous hours of uh, audiovisual content uh, which has been uh, uh, documented. Uh, we have a repository of information which, at one point, we would like to share with anybody who wants to actually pursue it. Um, so. Uh, one thing that's uh, that makes it a little different for me is I actually come from the private sector. Before I actually was onboarded onto the civil society space, uh, I I, uh, I was engaged in private sector, which I still am. I still run my uh, IT business and uh, and a few other businesses. So um, the fact that uh, I am on Loading Foundation is because I believe in social entrepreneurship, and uh, which is uh, quite new in the Bhutanese context. Um, I, I used to feel a little left out whenever I felt that uh, I am a businessman, but it's not just about making money. It's about a bigger, uh, there's a bigger purpose to it. And, uh, and then it was amazing that uh, you actually start connecting more with more people through the network. And then you realize that there's actually something called social entrepreneurship. Uh, 
have we figured out, uh, do we have regulations and rules and everything in place which actually differentiates you, whether you are a businessman and a social entrepreneur, not necessarily, but uh, has Loden been able to create that space and some recognition we have, and that is the contribution of Loden to the Bhutanese society. Um, and uh, so uh, one opportunity that I'd like to present here uh, is how I see is uh, the not necessarily the uh, private sector is totally engaged in in supporting and uh, the uh, the civil society's uh, movement in Bhutan. Uh, I think there's a big opportunity there, and uh, that is one uh, space for acceleration. And uh, I am aware that uh, UNDP is uh, doing a stakeholder or a study on the possibility of involving and making uh, this a bigger movement. Uh, I would like to bring this angle here, and with this, uh, I stop my introduction here. Okay, over to you. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Sange. I'm just going to check if you have uh, how, oh, okay. So there's one question. Let's just, because people are already watching us. So let's already make them a part of this conversation instead of keeping them right towards the end. And we have like, you know, we're just in the silo ourselves. Uh, there's a question from Claudio Zing. So the question is, how does the rule that public gatherings are not allowed three months before elections affect your CSO activity, you know? Um, I was in the CSO sector until recently as well, and I know that it does have some impact. So maybe Dr. Rinzi Rinzi could answer this question and Otencho and uh, Sange could chip in if you want. I mean, does the election have any impact on your CSO, how your CSO functions? Thank you so much, uh, dear friend Cla Claudio, for, for, for this very pertinent question. Uh, this, this provision of the election uh, law uh, really hampers our CSO's uh, works, actually. I'll give you an example. Recent, recently, now, now that the uh, NC elections are over, we are a, a bit relieved, but then there, there are the National Assembly elections coming. So so because we, because uh, all our uh, works, the CSO's works are project-based, which means we have to come start around January and complete all the works by uh, December, December. So, uh, and then Bhutan Transparency Initiative, to be honest, we have a couple of uh, projects at hand and we are supposed to complete all of them uh, before, uh, you know, the end of end of December. December. And now the NA elections are, are coming. Uh, the campaigns will start, I was told, by around October, which basically means we will have to complete all our works by the end of uh, September. So, uh, yes, uh, honestly, uh, this this law really affects us, us a lot. Thank you. Uh, I think it would be same for BCMD and uh, Lotan Sangi, do you want to say something? Or Otenjo, do you want to say something? Oh, you agree? Yeah, you're good. Okay, there's another question. Uh, yeah. Somebody uh, called Kenny. Sorry. Yes, Otencho, yes. Society work, but this rule is um, a right. So I think uh, this rule is applicable across the board and uh, everybody is affected. And uh, of course it really reduces the, um, uh, uh, you know, implementation period. And of our activities and events. So on that basis, uh, the, civil, um, the uh, election commission provides uh, the uh, approval as well. Uh, so I think uh, this rule is, is applied across the board. It is not just to a civil society organization, but it does affect the uh, work of CSOs, which are project-based and with very tight uh, deadline. Thank you. Thanks, Altenjo. I do have a question um, now because I think across the board, we were talking about how uh, the perception of CSOs is less than what we desire as uh, people who work in civil society. Um, what is, I mean, what is the Bhutan Civil Society Network as chair, like Dr. Rinzi, and also Altenjo working with BCMD and um, having a very good relationship with the media? What do you think could be done to improve the perception of uh, CSOs by Bhutanese people, because as has been done in the past by BTI and also, you know, when we're audited, we do see that CSOs do a lot of impactful work and mm -hmm. um, we are not, we, do, we, we are not doing the kind of work that 
people assume that we're doing that, you know, this is just like a family business, etc. So what do you have in mind? Because this is not a new issue. We've had this for a couple of years. So is the BCS and now as the chair of law, Dr. Renzi, uh, what are you, is there anything that you would like to do to counter this and then to improve the perception of CSO's law? Uh, yes, like we have already started our, our work to uh, ensure that we create more awareness about uh, our roles and mandates and uh, the, the kind of contributions that we make to nation build, building. So there, therefore, uh, we have already started firstly trying to uh, you know, create awareness to uh, mainly the uh, policymakers. Uh, and then the uh, parliamentarians. So, so we have we have already had a couple of uh, uh, meetings together, and we are going to uh, continue to uh, do this. And also, we are we are trying to create awareness uh, among the general uh, citizenry. Therefore, uh, uh, rec- recently uh, we also came up with a with a with an. Uh, with a very brief uh, report uh, on uh, CSOs, uh, which basically you know throw, throws light on what CSOs are doing, how many CSOs are there, there, there and uh, things, th- th- things, things like that. And especially with with media, because uh, uh, media are the main you know uh, medium of you know communication uh, between the uh, CSOs and the general uh, public. So. Uh, one thing we had to make sure was that media really understands the CSO's roles and what we are do, doing. There, there, therefore, uh, in collaboration with uh, Bhutan uh, Media Foundation, with support from Help Trust, uh, last last year, uh, the uh, report reporters and uh, editors from various media houses uh, were, you know, uh, given. Uh, basically, an uh, advocacy, advocacy and awareness on the roles of C- CSOs and what we are doing and why there are such mis- misconceptions and misgivings about CSOs, you know, and where lines should be draw- drawn between re- uh, registered CSOs and other forms of voluntary uh, organizations like uh, small associations and things like that. Like that. And, and now BCSN has been able to get some funds from uh, from uh, help it us international idea basically, basically to now uh, go on with our advocacy program so so uh, around uh, after the uh, once the campaign campaign starts <laughs> the uh, any election campaign start will be started we cannot go into the field so that, therefore uh, we will be meet, meeting with the members of the uh, uh, National Council and creating awareness on uh, what CSOs are doing, what our mandate mandates are, and then also try to try try, try to advocate them on how we can uh, work work together. And around next next month, we we will be uh, visiting a couple of uh, districts and you know uh, creating awareness on CSOs too. Basically, the uh, local government leaders uh, starting from the district magistrates and all the yeah, elected elected members of the uh, 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 local communities la. Les, uh, thank you so much. Uh, now, Dr. Sencho and Sangye, I want to ask you this question. It was something, it was a question asked by Reinhard Wolf earlier, where he was talking about, you know, we have this defined roles for the government as well as the civil society organizations, but are the rules clear, right? Like who has what role? Uh, oh, if you could speak from your experience uh, with engagement, civic engagement and Sangye, especially because you highlighted about the financial role that Lord and Foundations also takes in, uh, takes takes up, right? Bec- access to finance, et cetera and how you're filling that gap in between. So if the two of you could answer this question, like, do you think the roles are clear? Um, what CSO should do, what the government should do, what's happening here? Um, um, how do I put this? I, I think to a certain extent, uh, there is a clarity in the role of a civil society organization versus the government. Um, to a large extent, uh, uh, if you hear CSO, uh, head of the CSO, heads of the CSO speak, we call ourselves, uh, you know, complementing and su- supplementing the initiatives of the government and uh, reaching communities where the government is not able to reach. Uh, so in that way, there is a lot, there is a very clear distinction between the role of civil society organizations and um, the government. But uh, if you look at CSOs in the uh, more mature democracies, uh, civil society organizations play a much more 
uh, larger role than just supplementing and complementing government initiatives in terms of providing checks and balance, and also in terms of holding uh, you know, um, government uh, accountable. So, uh, so I think uh, for now, uh, CSOs in Bhutan are pretty uh, content playing a, a supplementary and complementary role, uh, but definitely there is much more bigger role that CSOs can play. Um, also with regard, one area where there is um, uh, you know, gray, uh, gray area for uh, CSO and government is in the area of policy. Um, policy formulation is a prerogative of the government, but a in a democratic setup, uh, any individual can contribute to that policy discussion. And I think that is where the gray area is, and that is where CSOs need to uh, work a little bit more in terms of influencing policy area. And many CSOs are small in Bhutan, and we are very clear about our own organizational mandate. And uh, all our efforts are focused on fulfilling those mandate and um, uh, you know, serving our, our constituencies. But in terms of influencing the policy environment, uh, we, I think we have a lot of work to do in terms of building our own capacity and also uh, developing that courage and also creating that space uh, for us to have this policy dialogue. Thank you. Thanks, Elton. I think before I move to Sange, another thing that I think I should highlight at this point as having been a member of civil society myself is how civil society, we don't take on a confrontational role in Bhutan. Like Elton highlighted, it's more a role of assisting and supplementing efforts by the government. And yes, we do require a little bit of courage as in do we, you know, say what we really need to say or uh, what is what is our identity? So and Elton also highlighted earlier that, you know, we're at this position in time where we're trying to really figure out our identity too. Like what is our real identity? Are we really, I think, living uh, the reality uh, of who we should be as CSOs in Bhutan? Sange, um, now I'm going to bring you in. I think you're also going to talk about another gray area. <laughs> Let's hear you now. <laughs> um, no, like uh, there are times you, you sit in the office and there is so much running at the office itself, Lord Foundation. Uh, and uh, so must be the case at Bhutan Transparency Initiative, the BCC, BCSN office, and even at BCMG and all the other uh, 52, 54 CSOs, uh, that uh, we are swamped with work. We know so much to be done and uh, we, we keep our days going. There's so much to be done. And there are times when uh, you actually sit down and you realize that uh, uh, certain things backfire. Uh, for example, at this point, uh, uh, we, we actually, uh, London Foundation, we, we give this uh, seat money. Uh, for entrepreneurs to start the businesses. And, and there are times when uh, after we actually loan out the money, uh, because we do not necessarily have this uh, institutional, uh, uh, or uh, we are not really authorized to basically give out loans. We do not necessarily sit in any sort of regulation, but uh, we are here doing good work and people realize that and then Almost all the agencies and authorities have been really helpful with us, uh, and they they facilitated us. Uh, but there are times when we actually pursue this case, and then uh, our entrepreneurs, let's say, uh, some of them, not all of them, necessarily do good, and then we have to actually get back the money and make them socially responsible citizens, and then we persuade the court. I'm using a very specific case here, and then when when we actually reach to the judiciary, there are instances where uh, we cannot pursue penalties to actually make a person socially responsible because you have not really paid back the money. We actually want to roll this money so that the next entrepreneur who wants to be made actually can avail this loan and impact his life. So uh, basically the court turns around and says that you can take uh, the, the money which has been financed, but you cannot actually charge a penalty. And our question, the next question would be, we actually want to make this person responsible and not let it go scot-free. This is how you establish accountability, but uh, these are not uh, happening. and. Uh, now, are we being considered? Are we being heard out? Uh, I think definitely, but uh, is it moving fast enough? Maybe not. Uh, are we the most coordinated? I don't think so. Even coordination between the civil societies, like how uh, uh, Dr. Rinzi Rinzi has shared, ha has not happened. So not really putting the blame on anybody, but uh, this should happen and it should move forward faster. Uh, this is what I'd like to share here. And uh, when it comes to, uh, for example, access to finance, 
uh, there are times when uh, some entrepreneurs uh, uh, do some amazing work and uh, uh, and then they, they need access to finance uh, without a collateral, uh, without mortgages, they cannot actually access any finance. Uh, uh, then uh, approaching financial institutions where they could actually really make an impact, like uh, getting a getting a huge amount of money, basically, right? Uh, because there is a guaranteed market there. Uh, these mechanisms are still not in place. And uh, uh, when it even comes to uh, incubation, uh, a specific uh, incubator in Bhutan, do we have one? We, we have uh, small incubators at uh, universities happening, but uh, have we really worked together? Uh, uh, we have not. So uh, like, has the civil society stepped up? Has Lodin really stepped up and said that we want to do it? Uh, maybe we are also reminded that we're just a civil society. Can we really take this lead? Uh, are we the right agents to do it? So there is definitely a lot of uh, uh, confused thoughts and uh, mixed thoughts and uh, no real clarity on uh, what we could do and what we could not do. Mm -hmm. Definitely more work for Dr. Rinzi to think about as chair of BCSN. But there's a question which I have, I had for the panelists and which Reinhard Wolf actually messaged right now in a chat room. Uh, he wants to, he's pointing to the substantial migration of young and qualified people, mainly to Australia. Uh, I've lost my program officer to Australia as well, previously from JAB. Uh, she's also headed off to Australia. So the question is, how do you judge this development for Bhutan in general and how does this affect your work as CSO? So anybody is welcome uh, to answer. All of you are welcome to answer this question. Uh, can I go first? <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, ju ju just like Jeb, uh, Bhutan Transparency Initiative has also been affected. In, in fact, uh, now, uh, all our staffs are new. <laughs> we have to recruit every uh, all, all new 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 ones because some left for uh, Australia, some for uh, Canada, and you know now, now a lot of youth are uh, li living, uh, and even the oldies are living. In fact, in fact, I know of uh, you know of a family whole family left for Australia. Uh, uh, you know, and and the oldest member member in the family family is 84 years old uh, which as a citizen concern, you know you know like what is you, you know what's happening to this country now, now you know why is, why is everybody <laughs> leaving yes like it is it, it worries us uh, because we because we we are uh, so uh, you know like um, we, we are citizens we have to look after our country, country at the end of the day anyway we have to live here live in harmony be be happy but when the, when your happiness is put into question obviously this is a major you know uh, problem uh, for the country and then uh, at the moment, be it, be it the gov government, the state, or or us, the C CSOs, nobody seems to have any 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 answers to you know like any solutions to the to the problem. This is the this is the most worrying uh, you know the, the part of it all. It all. Uh, thank you. Yes, thanks, Dr. Nzila. That's so, um... I think uh, Bhutanese migrating out. Uh, um, tells us a lot about how the world is more connected now. And that there are more opportunities beyond the borders. And uh, to me, I think it's just, um, uh, it's inevitable as, as the country develops, uh, people would migrate. It also tells a lot about how our own uh, value system, values are changing. Um, and it also tells a lot about how a lot of things uh, uh, in the country needs to undergo uh, transformation. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, the whole process of uh, civil service reform and transformation is to bring about more enabling policies. And I hope that, uh, you know, that process is expedited because we need more enabling policy environment for civil society uh, to flourish, for the private sector to flourish, for the civil service, uh, you know, to also uh, perform uh, in, in the service of uh, the society. So I think uh, it is not just the CSOs that are affected again, it is across the board. The whole, all sectors are struggling for that matter. Private sector is affected, civil society is affected. And uh, the civil service, which is, um, you know, perceived as the most uh, prestigious sector to to get an employment uh, in, 
is also affected. Thank you. What about you, Sangya? I mean, you straddle both worlds. You see the civil society sector, you see the private sector as well. And uh, I know all of us have seen a little bit of the impact, but do share your experiences with us. Uh, opening up from 70s, from self-isolation, imposed isolation to 2022, 2023, a huge migration, migrating population, uh, conventional bank turning into crypto investments. These are all transformations that happened. Uh, let's say in the past 50 years, uh, with changes, uh, with opening up, I think a big impact of the internet being globally connected, uh, people actually have realizing that they have actually more choices. Uh, uh, with the recent uh, recent uh, transformation and, uh, and then the civil servants uh, and basically making decisions have actually created this, uh, this FOMO, the fear of missing out and where people who have actually not even thought about migrating, actually jumping on the bandwagon and saying that maybe I should go as well. Uh, uh, have we really figured out why people are doing this? Have we actually really done a study? Uh, has uh, any of the civil societies actually taken effort to actually do a study? Uh, are we comfortable doing this study? These are some questions as well, uh, which, which comes to me. Uh, has anybody else done this study? It's, uh, it comes to me as well. And uh, at Lowland Foundation, we have uh, basically uh, uh, there are about six uh, six of them who have separated with us. Uh, some of them have actually got pretty decent jobs uh, coming from a civil society space in Bhutan and having been communications officer here. They actually landed pretty decent job in Australia as well. Uh, three three months in Australia and they actually got good jobs. Uh, what sort of a message does that send? That if you are actually quite capable and if you come down, you can actually make you can get a good job as well. And uh, that also says that uh, there are capable people who by Australian standards are capable and maybe even when you do it, yeah, they're capable as well. Uh, one drastic uh, change that has happened at Lodal Foundation is uh, uh, the civil society, any change, especially peace structure, was mainly uh, the benchmark was the, the civil servants. Whenever there was a, a pay structure change in the civil service, in the private sector, the, the, the employees would actually come and talk about, oh, there's a change in the civil service. So uh, will there be a change in our pay structure as well? That's how it used to be. And at Lozen Foundation, this time we had to do it a little different. Uh, the, the, the pay structure uh, that uh, the civil service was getting was maybe not enough. That was the message that was coming out. Uh, maybe they were looking for more. And then at Lozen Foundation, we had to go deeper and figure out what were the reasons? And then we thought, okay, so even the incentive should be better, and maybe there should be more considerations on how to how we go about things. So uh, it has actually uh, opened up more discussions, and uh, we have not waited on the six pay commission to come out with the restructuring, but we went about with our own restructuring. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that, Sangye. And uh, just to explain to our viewers, both uh, Otenjo as well as Sangye alluded to something called a transformation. It's uh, it's a phenomenon that's been happening in Bhutan over the last couple of months where a lot of restructuring has been happening. We've uh, restructured our ministries as well. There's a lot of things happening in the civil service. Um, so that's basically, and we're calling it transformation in Bhutan because really it's a transformative uh, process. So that was what they were alluding to. Uh, we have a question from Frank Hoffman, and this is for Dr. Renzi. Uh, uh, he says, you spoke about international cooperation and mentioned the potential role of donors. In which areas do you see scope and learning from civil society organizations in other countries? Is there any country that you look at in particular as an example, uh, Dr. Renzi, when you're looking at international cooperation? have to unmute yourself, Les. Les, thank you. Oh, all right. All right. So so, sorry, this, this is one of the reasons why, why I was saying that C, C, uh, C, Bhutanese CSOs uh, need to uh, develop, you know, uh, networking and need to network with CSOs in the region and uh, elsewhere uh, in, internationally. Uh, most of the C, C, Bhutanese CSOs have uh, no exposure to, you know, the, the, or, you know, like we have had no opportunities to uh, work closely with C CSOs in the region as well as uh, elsewhere. This is why I was, uh, you know, like because because today our host host is the uh, Patrick Newman Foundation, and then you know they they, they uh, support CSOs. This is why I was uh, flagging this up uh, because we would like to learn 
you know, best practices in other countries uh, as well. As of now, I cannot point out uh, directly, uh, but uh, very especially when it com comes to uh, funding CSOs, I have the like uh, uh, the Nordic countries uh, in in mind, whereby uh, I heard that uh, that the government uh, puts a certain portion of the total bu bu budget, you know. Uh, uh, earmark certain portion of the uh, government budget, one to two percent maybe, uh, for C CSOs. Now, this is not a possibility for Bhutan, given that our coffers are very, <laughs> uh, our government coffers are very, very shallow. This is why I'm approaching uh, to, uh, you know, uh, development partners and uh, and donors all, all over the world to come to CSOs uh, rescue, re, re, rescue, put new CSOs rescue so, so, so that, you know, like we can continue to do the, the, the great things that we are doing right now. I want to I want to bring in Sangi at this point. You were talking about an opportunity where you were saying you would look at. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you were saying we could explore private sector support here, right? For CSO so Sangi, do you want to elaborate on that? Um, yes, uh, uh, there there is definitely a possibility, but uh, at this point, maybe the economy. Uh, maybe the, the the key question is how strong is the economy? No, no. Uh, um, um, there are times uh, a lot of our donors and well wishes from uh, different countries always ask uh, how, how committed are the Bhutanese to our own civil society? And uh, it has actually uh, sent a lot of deep thoughts uh, to myself where I've actually reached out. And, and then uh, it is, it is uh, it's quite open. Like I'm sure that uh, we would agree uh, that uh, there are uh, entities out there who are willing to help. But at this point in time, I think right uh, when we uh, we could actually discuss and write on this whole uh, uh, inculcating or bringing on our private sector people on board for the civil society uh, support, uh, the, the economy actually went bust. At this point in time, I think uh, everybody's looking for some sort of assistance. And if only the Bhutanese economy was uh, way stronger, I, I think uh, the, the private sector here uh, would definitely uh, uh, come on board and help uh, our own civil society as well. Um, thanks, Sangeet, for sharing that. There's a question from Claudio Zing again. Um, if you could be a more active as CSOs in the area of policy, would it be perceived as interference from abroad because of foreign financing, as Dr. Rinzi shared earlier, also saying a lot of CSOs are heavily dependent on external donations. Um, so could this be perceived as being interference? Uh, who would like to answer this question? Uh, may, uh, I'll give it a try. Yes. Uh, uh, especially uh, with with the two uh, documents that I, I mentioned, the CSO government collaboration and the CSO uh, parliament uh, collaboration strategy. Especially with these uh, two 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 do documents uh, in the words of implementation. Now, I think I think CSOs will be more and more uh, involved in in policy uh, development uh, processes, and I don't think that government will uh, uh, perceive this as kind of interference uh, from, from the from the CSO. But uh, CSOs must also be uh, mindful that uh, we should do uh, things the way way they, they way they must be done. Especially especially in our in our, in our country, we must be tactful, diplomatic, you know, uh, and. Uh, especially uh, with the while we we were talking with members of par parliament, uh, they are in fact very open to you know like uh, get get uh, inputs and concerns you know like issues from from the CSOs because now they they, they understand that CSOs are directly you know connect connected and we work uh, with the gra grassroots levels Sangay or Otencho, do you would you like to add anything? Sure. Yes. Uh, yes. I can elaborate. Uh, um, I think uh, um, that question merits us to reflect on why CSOs exist in the first place. Uh, CSOs exist because we want to do good in the society. So I think if CSOs uh, propose uh, policy recommendations uh, and uh, propose new policies, which are for the benefit of the society, I think it's a matter of uh, justifying the need for it. And uh, when, when there is enough justification and when what CSOs are doing is 
um, in uh, alignment with the country's uh, priorities and uh, the uh, five-year plans, uh, I think there is support to it. But with regard to whether it's going to be perceived as foreign uh, interference or not, I think uh, uh, Bhutan is no different. All other countries across the world uh, would be wary of uh, foreign uh, interference. But for CSOs to work in the area of policy is a matter of uh, uh, you know, explaining uh, the need and demonstrating the need for policy change. Thank you. Les, uh, thank you. Sangeet, do you have anything to add? No, oh, okay. Yeah, I think another thing that I think needs to be said at this point, especially uh, through my experience with CSOs, is also that Bhutanese CSOs just don't take money from anyone and everywhere. I think we also have a certain amount of integrity. We look at the donors, what is the kind of work that they do, and then see if it's aligned with our own objectives, and then we move forward. I don't think that, I mean, the perception of Bhutanese CSOs that we just take money from everywhere, uh, we don't operate like that. I think I want to take this opportunity to actually clarify and say that we also have a, we have integrity, we have an internal vetting process, and then we look at alignment and then see, also, can we assist the government by taking this project forward? So it's not like we are money hungry and money grabbers. <laughs> So this is something I think I'm speaking on behalf of all uh, Putinese CSOs. There's a question from Dr. Klein, which I think I will invite Dr. Denshaw to answer, and maybe I'll have a little bit of an input too. He's asking, are women and women-related topics represented sufficiently in the CSO sector? Um, to a certain extent, I would say uh, yes, because... Uh, uh, civil society sector is much more inclusive and we are much more uh, tolerant and accepting of uh, diversity. And uh, we have CSOs uh, established uh, in particular to promote uh, you know, women uh, participation uh, in politics and uh, to fight uh, to um, push for more gender equality and to protect the more vulnerable sections of the population. So I think uh, uh, within the civil society organizations, we, we are much more open. And there are CSOs uh, which are established to promote the LGBTI uh, community and to fight against uh, discrimination of that community. So I would say yes, but do we know uh, of all the issues of uh, women in the society? Are we advocating enough? Maybe not. And that is where we need to, um, I think, put our efforts in. Thank you. I think you answered that quite well, and I, it does not require additional input from my end. Uh, I think I want to take this question uh, from one of our Putinese members in the audience. Uh, so this is a long question, but I think you can see how you want to answer this. I'm going to read it out as the person has typed it in. Our country is facing brain drain, youth and adults alike are moving out to countries that have greater economic freedom. Uh, what measures are Putinese CSOs taking to liberalize our country's economy? Me. Do we have any organization that works primarily with improving economic freedom in DICES? Um, I don't know. I think, Sangeet, this is completely up your alley. And maybe Dr. Rinzi, do you want to try and answer this question? Because I know that CSOs, we don't just like, there's not just one CSO that is working towards this. But um, I don't know if anybody would like to answer this. I'll, 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 I'll make an attempt. Uh... It's not just the loan, uh, loan foundations. So I'd like to uh, bring in some more examples. For example, Tariana works with the grassroots. They have things called like self-help groups, the small business loans, empowering women activities. Uh, similarly, uh, YDF does a, that as well. They have an activity called My Gucket Village, where it's all about empowering the rural community. Uh, also a bit of uh, travel and tourism there so that they can actually make an income. Uh, uh, and loading comes in and uh, we, we try to give uh, seat money for uh, individuals to start businesses. Uh, have we attempted? We have. CS was have tried. Uh, is, uh, is it enough uh, the, what the civil societies are doing? And I'm sorry if I missed out uh, the other activities that the civil societies are doing, but I'm just citing a few examples. And uh, it's not enough because uh, some of the entrepreneurs that we have supported, uh, from my account, 20 of them have actually left out Australia. Uh, but have they have they actually turned their back? Not. They've actually gone down to Australia and they started repaying our loan. So it, it's it's a good thing for Loading Foundation. They're actually repaying. Uh, could they could they repay us when they were in Bhutan? 
That is the more uh, pertinent question. They could not. But now they're in Australia, they have their business operational here, and there's actually uh, somebody else running it here. And uh, they are still doing some economic activity in Australia and paying us. So I think I think at the end of the day, the, the question really is about how strong is our economy at this point? Are we being able to churn enough? Are we making enough to pay our own people uh, you know, what needs to be paid to? Uh, and and then uh, also diversifying the economy. I think that's that's where the question has come to for me at least. And uh, 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 can the so civil societies do more? We could, uh, but how do we do it? I think that, that that that's why we're having this discussion here today. Thanks, Sanke. I hope uh, that's answered your question, Killer, to an extent. Uh, Dr. Rinzi, would you like to add anything? Oh, no, no, I think that was that was that was an excellent answer. Uh, uh, Sange, uh, no, not Sange, Namge. Uh, yes. if, you, if we have time, I, I would like to uh, talk briefly on uh, two small points. La. Please I? go ahead, Dr. Rinzi. Yes, I was going to come to you. Yes, la. One is basically on uh, CSO visibility. La. Uh, the mm. the visi visi visibility of CSOs have been uh, very poor uh, until recently, but recently it has really improved, especially during the last uh, couple, couple of months. Now, uh, the, CS, the media seems to understand CSOs much, much better now. And now, now they are interested, I guess, in even promoting C C C CSOs. And I'm really grateful to uh, both, uh, 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 especially B BBS, and also the also print media who featured uh, C CSOs often uh, during the last couple of months. In, in fact, I myself was, uh, I, I myself was on four, four uh, talk shows uh, since last 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 October, which basically means now, see, uh, 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 people uh, the media understands people uh, uh, the CSOs better, and now they are also helping us uh, to uh, to ensure that the public understands uh, CSOs better. So our visibility now has really you know Im Im improved. Our image has also uh, I improved. I, I must emphasize emphasize this. The other the other thing is CSOs role as uh, as an as oversight bo body now here to you know uh, in a subtle way, subtle way CSOs have already uh, uh, started this venture venture for instance uh, Bhutan Transparency Initiative uh, has recently uh, had the opportunity to assess the quality of services provided by the uh, justice sectors the, the 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 seven institutions of the uh, justice justice sector now this is huge normally uh, given any other country it is it, it it will be a herculean task it will be uh, uh, in fact impossible to you know uh, assess the assess the services of the uh, ju judiciary uh, you know by law judiciary even in our country is almost untouchable <laughs> no institution can touch the uh, ju judiciary but then we CSOs have been able to gain the uh, trust and confidence of the judiciary. The judiciary agreed to, to, to be assessed. So we were able to assess and then we presented the uh, re report and the report was even shared uh, shared live on uh, BBS uh, the, the, through, a, through a talk show, which is a very good sign that, that you know, like the acceptance of CSOs to the, uh, to the general public, is especially, especially the, 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 the institutions of the various institutions of the state. Is is really you know like uh, now uh, in, in increasing, uh, and then uh, again, Bhutan Transparency Initiative uh, has been uh, conducting uh, the National Corruption Barometer uh, Survey, which is outsourced to BTI by the Anti Corruption uh, Commission of Bhutan, because BTI is an independent uh, you know uh, orga organization, and this is now we just completed the. Uh, uh, National Corruption Barometers Survey 2023, uh, just a few days, few days ago, and this is the third, third of its kind that BTI has been doing, and and this provides the uh, the, the main uh, da database, the information on the on the types of corruption, the forms of corruption, the levels of cor corruption in the in the in the country, and this is done by by no other than a, a, a C, C, CSO, and uh, and the information that the data, data that we provide is is used. By, by by the government and all the government, government uh, 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 other institutions. This is the kind of trust and confidence that uh, we have been uh, able to gain over, over the years. So I thought mentioning uh, this would be uh, important. And at the same time, uh, 
holding, uh, holding uh, let's say, uh, public institutions accountable for the services they provide. BTI uh, has, over the last couple of years, uh, been pioneering in trying to uh, promote social accountability at the grassroots level. So we have already trained, trained uh, local communities in uh, five uh, uh, districts th thus far, and uh, uh, four municipal, uh, two muni municipalities. And, and, and the outcomes have been really, uh, uh, you know, like uh, interesting, whereby we were through, through social accountability, we were able to, you know, like uh, make people understand their, their rights and also know the techniques how to assess the quality of services provided by the service providers, whereby in one of, one of the villages, a road, road which was badly done and, and you know, possibly uh, left to the public, was assessed by the uh, social accountability uh, practitioners group of that that village, and the report was submitted to the district, uh, you know, administration, and the contractor was forced to redo the uh, work. And now they have a beautiful farm road, you know. So CSOs had been able to, uh, you know, uh, carry on our uh, functions as oversight uh, bodies as well. So, mm -hmm. thank you, thank you for the opportunity. Very encouraging to hear, Dr. Renzi, and uh, keep up the good work that uh, BTI is doing. Uh, Dr. Sanju, you have your hand raised, so I'm going to come over to you now. Yes, yeah, I just wanted to go back to uh, the lack of coordination, which uh, both uh, Dr. Rinzen Rinzen and Sange alluded to early on. Um, I think uh, uh, over the years, uh, CSOs in Bhutan are much more organized and uh, we have a sense of, we share a you know, sense of solidarity amongst ourselves. Um, uh, with regard to coordination, I think we have improved over the years, but are we perfect? No. Why we are not perfect is because we are dependent on projects and donors, and each donor has a different pro project deadlines. So, so long as the CSOs in the country are dependent on our donors, uh, perfect coordination is, uh, it's, uh, you know, something um, utopian, I would say. Uh, but is there a way forward to that? Yes, because in Bhutan, um, the local contribution to civil society work is negligible unless we are a religious organization. Uh, Bhutanese people give um, generously to uh, religious activities and to a certain extent to um, uh, health-related organizations. But uh, for governance, uh, you know, CSOs in the area of governance like BCMD, BTI, be new, uh, you know, um, because our work does not result in something tangible, right? It is not like uh, planting trees or saving a life, but it is about changing pe people's mindset and behavior. And so therefore people don't give. So for CSOs in Bhutan to um, not to be donor dependent, I think the society has a lot to think about. Um, and, but, um, I would also like to share that uh, the amended act of the Civil Society Act uh, allows for CSOs to build endowment. And uh, the Civil Society Authority uh, has been uh, consulting all CSOs uh, and sensitizing CSOs about how we have to build uh, you know, endowment and move towards our own sustainability. And I think that is a good initiative uh, being taken. Thank you. Okay, I've received a message that we are running out of time. So I want to thank uh, the wonderful panelists for giving us a really good view of the civil society sector in Bhutan. And it was really nice to converse with people who I previously worked with. It was very, it was very nice to see you here again today. And I'm very hopeful about the path ahead, like Otenshu shared. I think uh, the civil society sector is so much more organized, and especially with the BCSN now, and a lot of people, including Dr. Rinzi yourself, taking a lot of initiative and giving a lot of time uh, to bringing CSOs together, I think a lot more is going to happen. And I look forward to a lot of good things happening in the civil society space. I'm going to hand over to the Friedrich Naumann Foundation now, Love. Okay, I don't know if anybody wants to. Uh, Dr. Dr. Klein, do you, I think I'm handing over to you now, Dr. Klein.
very much. Um, well, first of all, um, dear respected uh, speakers, um, Dr. Renzen Renzen, Dr. Chenju Lamu, and um, uh, Mr. Sangai Tering, and of course, um, dear Mrs. Uh, Namgai Tsam, thank you very, very much uh, for this extremely interesting um, elaboration on the, um, well, most important uh, sector of society uh, in a democratic uh, country, um, I think, and um, for us uh, here in the region in general, um, I could only say that uh, Bhutan is amongst the role models uh, in the region. And of course, it uh, also um, is a, a country where very many people in um, South Asia and also from Europe um, from America and, and other regions take an enormous interest in. So I think that is something what um, is positive, especially also for the growing of the uh, CSO sector. I just um, would like to um, stress that, uh, of course, um, the prosperous development of civil society needs certain factors, um, a good legal framework, uh, a reliable financial framework, uh, open-minded actors in uh, politics, in administration, um, good social support, and as you have rightly said, an uh, international networking. And most importantly, people who pursue uh, their goals and particular projects in uh, the sector you're working in. And in my uh, very few times, I had the opportunity uh, to, 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 to travel to Bhutan. I saw especially many younger people, um, also uh, people from different uh, groups, from different professions, working in this particular sector. And I think that is something what is really also an extremely positive role model for a very good track of um, the civil society in the country. The Nauman Foundation will definitely support. That is, uh, Dr. Renzen, what you said, um, just one sector where we could really help to um, um, draw a little bit more light on um, the civil society sector in the country, and especially uh, by uh, providing uh, some more networks. Dear friends, um, in, in this particular context, I would like also to highlight again Deutsche Bhutan Himalaya Gesellschaft. Um, they have an excellent network, not only in Germany, but also in Europe and in, uh, and in other uh, regions. And um, they definitely are extremely good partners uh, of help and, and of um, of um, uh, good um, uh, ideas and projects uh, for uh, your future endeavors. The Nauman Foundation South Asia is very happy um, to have Bhutan Media Foundation as a partner in Bhutan. Um, they are working on extremely important fields like uh, stages of journalism and uh, spreading media awareness. We are very, very happy that with these seminars, we open um, different perspectives uh, to a broader public, but uh, also in Germany. I think um, there will be, there is this enormous interest. And uh, I'm also very happy um, uh, that uh, we could provide, also help to provide outside the country, a balanced but positive image uh, about Bhutan. With that, we um, also invite Bhutanese experts to each and uh, all of our conferences, to all of our seminar, uh, seminars, uh, which we carry out in South Asia. And of course, we are very, very happy with your help uh, to do that in future as well. Thank you very much with these uh, small little thank you certificates again to our moderator, Nandai Sam, our speakers, 
it was so nice uh, having you here on the program. And um, we will definitely uh, continue our conversation. And um, I would like also to thank uh, the board members of Bhutan Himalaya Association Society for their continuous help. And last but not least, thanks to um, our dear colleagues from Friedrich Naumann Foundation family. Thank you very much, Mr. Vogt, uh, to the most northern office of the foundation in Germany. And uh, thank you very much to my colleagues here in the uh, office for um, always being uh, the motors behind uh, all these projects. Thanks a lot. Uh, please do follow us uh, in our social media channels. Um, especially, there will be um, a bit of a questionnaire regarding um, your uh, take on um, this webinar. So uh, we would highly appreciate if you could um, just take one or two minutes to fill that in. Thanks again uh, to all of you. We'll seeing you soon in uh, Bhutan or in, in, in India. Or elsewhere, thanks a lot again, and Tashi Delek from New Delhi. Thank you.